Hello and welcome to another edition of Kota Uda. This is the Kota, I am Uda and with me today Ambika Satkunanathan who is a former Human Rights Commissioner for the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka. She's a human rights lawyer and advocate. She's also the chairperson of the Neelan Thiruchalvam Trust. And of course there are some who would say well that's because the the, it is only the poor that commit crimes, really not so. Because when you look at what the people who are in prison, many of them are in prison because they can't pay fines. That's because right. they can't get a lawyer to apply for bail. Mm. Because bail has become the exception rather than the norm in Sri Lanka. But at the same time, uh, if you have social status, if you are privileged, then really even the you don't face that, do you? No, you no. go, you go to hospital <laughs> go and to prison enjoy hospital. other amenities. A uh, prison hospital, which mm. is actually much, much nicer than the rest of the prison system, sure. is quite, uh, quite pleasant in, mm -hmm. in comparison. Yeah, the right. fact that people seem to understand, and me at least for the first time that I, in my memory, they understand what it means to be a citizen. Yeah, we need to demand answers, but they also seem to understand that it's not about their rights and their entitlements but that they also have a civic duty but people generally think that if you are let's say someone um, accused of drug trafficking then it's okay to you know rough you around to smack you a bit to torture you mm. but if it's a quote-unquote good person then oh my god they can't be tortured that in itself a prop is a problem because oh that's a very telling <laughs> distinction you're making i'm sure i'm like thinking about it and thinking we all do that don't we absolutely we, we're all i'm used to receiving a lot of uh, racist backlash yes uh, but i must say that uh, the backlash i received for my tweet about the national anthem was quite unlike anything i had experienced do before. tell uh, <laughs> It was uh, people calling me racist, mm. people saying that I am creating an ethnic conflict. It seems like all you have to do, say, say you supported a tweet saying, you know, the Tamil national anthem should be sung. It seems like all you have to do to kind of shut someone up is yeah. say, oh, you're an LTTE Absolutely. supporter. <laughs> Right, and you, you get it from all sides. I know yes. that I've seen that just, you know, from pro LTT supporters as well. Um, saying it but um, is that what makes us so afraid to confront the question of Tamil nationality do they belong here do they not are their rights being infringed upon every day you know people are scared to go there I feel like what's happening is great but also I feel like people are afraid to be openly supportive of injustice towards the Tamil community because you're going to be labelled pro-LTTE. The military runs these large farms in the north, right? That's state subsidised. The government, all our taxpayer money yeah. is what is going to subsidise that. Then from the produce, the agricultural produce that they get from that, they sell at below market rates particularly in an uh, economic environment where people have very little money, naturally people will go and buy from them because their rates are so low. Right. But what happens to the local farmer? They are undercutting the local farmers. The local farmers find it very difficult. Now, this is not something that I, that has been happening now. Yeah. This is, if you go there to the Kilnoche something, even when I was went there, like, you know, in 2010, people were saying it. Now it's 2022, people are still saying it. Yeah. Uh, why, why can't you have the agricultural department then running these farms? Then you can actually employ people in it. Why don't you support local farmers, encourage local farming? The brand of politics and toxic masculinity. The fact that we have patriarchal, sexist, misogynist males who crave power, who don't take advice, who don't listen to others, who don't believe that governance is empathy, that you need empathy who think that to squash is power. And that is a huge problem. Yeah. That is a huge problem.
Hello and welcome to another edition of Kota Uda. This is the Kota, I am Uda and with me today Ambika Satkunanathan who is a former Human Rights Commissioner for the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka. She's a human rights lawyer and advocate. She's also the chairperson of the Neelan Thiruchalvam Trust and she led the first study into the prison system in Sri Lanka and is currently also working on women in jail or in the prison system because of drugs and women you, incarcerated also, yes yeah, for uh, drug offenses and you're also looking into drugs within the prison system uh, not within the prison system generally the war on drugs right. as the the go then government termed it and also it's continuing now the laws related to drugs yeah the problems with that uh, whether they uh, adhere to human rights standards or not how they're implemented and whether that is actually a progressive uh, system that we have that protects the rights of uh, prisoners. You know, pr well, yeah, just citizens even. Yes. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So, I mean, could you share something with us from from this study? Some of the things that stood out to you most? Uh, the prison study or the yes, drug? The prison <laughs> study. <laughs> right. yeah. uh, the prison study. Well, I would say that uh, uh, when I approach uh, the study, I did not think that by the end of the study, I would become or move towards prison abolition. Uh, because right. I feel that the system that we have, firstly, it is discriminatory. It is, there is a power imbalance. Because when you go to prison, you see that more than 90% of persons or maybe even more than 95% of persons in prison are those who are poor, those who come from marginalized backgrounds. Right. And you do not see the wealthy in prisons. And of course, there are some who would say, well, that's because the, the it is only the poor that commit crimes. Really not so. Because when you look at what the people who are in prison, many of them are in prison, because they can't pay fines, That's because right. they can't get a lawyer to apply for bail, mm. because bail has become the exception rather than the norm in Sri Lanka. Uh, right. So those are many yeah. of the reasons. And also, if you look at um, who commits like, and what do you con consider a crime? So a man who is poor, we saw that uh, just a few months ago, he went into the supermarket mm. to uh, <clears throat> I think he stole uh, eau de cologne and something, something else. Like a that milk was exactly, session. exactly, and that was what he needed for his daughter. He was desperate. He was yeah. pushed to that, mm. and we saw what happened then. But uh, you find uh, large financial crimes. They may be deemed, you know, it's corruption. It is legal, but how many are arrested for it? or incarcerated for it yeah. and even if they are incarcerated for it that has absolutely appears to have no impact on their social status they still retain their friends right. they might have yeah. so many allegations of corruptions but their reputation is not dented right. but the man who stole some bananas from some place will be vilified and uh, incarcerated, probably languish in jail for months yeah. uh, while their family uh, falls apart. So our concept of what is a crime? How do we view crime? Uh, how do we prevent people from going to prison? Yeah. Which means you also need to tackle the root causes of crime, inequality, violence, poverty, yeah. poverty all that, the root causes. But of course that, you know, takes a lot of time, it will take it a does. lot of energy, take a lot of money. Yeah. So it is actually easier to just arrest someone, throw them in jail and then feel that we have uh, done justice. Something good, you know, meanwhile that person's family is languishing, they might have lost their only breadwinner. Absolutely, bread Absolutely. that is something we saw a lot about people's main concern was the people who are in prison and because most of them are men. Uh, we have a very small percentage only or like 8% of women um, uh, in our prison system. The men who are in prison, their main concern always when they talk to you is about their families. Yeah. It's about now what, you know, they are like, they are in great difficulty. Uh, children's education has been impacted, their livelihood because they were the main income earners and they would always ask us, can you find a way to help us? families yes the other problem is that if we, when someone goes to prison we view them as a criminal yes in the sense of if the person is 
demonized. But yeah. once again, as I said, if you look at the profile of the people in prison, many of them are from poor, marginalized, discriminated against backgrounds. Uh, and we label them that. But at the same time, uh, if you have social status, if you are privileged, then really even the... You don't face that, do you? No, you, no. Go, you go to hospital. <laughs> go and to prison enjoy hospital. Enjoy other amenities. A prison hospital, which mm. is actually much, much nicer than the rest of the prison system. Sure. It's quite, uh, quite pleasant in, mm -mm. in comparison. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, you're talking really um, about systemic change on a grand scale. And it seems to me in the last month, well, in the last 30 months, you know, we've come to this place where suddenly everything is not working all at the same time. And I think it's, it's, I, I personally can't see like a way out. There's, there's so much to be done. Mm. In your opinion, and just as your opinion, like, what do we start with? Huh. <laughs> oh, that's an easy question. To oh, excellent. Um, you said uh, in your, uh, you said everything is not working now, or it's not. But I think it's not been working for, for a, very, a while, for a very yeah. long time. Just that we managed to paper over mm. the cracks, mm -hmm. and also it appeared like it was working. I think because citizens also did not raise their voice. Yeah, they were like, we will not. They were. They didn't hold the people in power responsible. They yeah. were not demanding answers or accountability. So it seemed like everything was working. But for people who uh, tried to help, um, you know, uh, people, some, you know, people who need to access state system, for instance, that is when you realize things really don't work. Yeah. Even if we take a person who is affected by, let's say, family violence, domestic violence, yeah. um, you know, it's, recourse to the state is very difficult. And not just that, protection mechanisms, yeah. shelters, mm. livelihood opportunities. Yeah. And I know many women who haven't come out of their violent homes because if they come out, well, firstly, we, we, finding a shelter is quite impossible. Yes. Even if you find a shelter, maximum one, two, three weeks, um, maximum four weeks is where, uh, how long they'll be allowed to stay in that. Yeah. After that, where do they go? Yeah. We need to find them uh, a livelihood option. But some of them may not have the qualifications, etc., to get the job. Then what do you do? Therefore, the women themselves, they explore this option. And at some point, they're like, we don't want to. I think we'll just stay here. And it's, you feel really helpless and yeah. horrible, like yeah. you failed them. But it's actually the system yeah. that has completely failed them. So it has not been working on so many levels for a long time. Where do we start? Oh God, sometimes when you ask, when you wonder that, mm. it does um, feel like it is, it is overwhelming. It and is, <laughs> it is because you do need people to sort of work together for the good of the country yeah. without taking bribes, without sort of enabling their families. Um, and it requires real consensus between institutions. And right now, especially even today, it feels um, unachievable. But I would say this. To me, because I've been working on this for a very long time, I would say perhaps now it does feel achievable. Okay. I, until now, I was not hopeful. Right. And the reason I'm hopeful now is because of what I see in our citizenry. The right. fact that people seem to understand, and me at least for the first time that I, in my memory, they understand what it means to be a citizen. Yeah. We need to demand answers, but they also seem to understand that it's not about their rights and their entitlements, but that they also have a civic duty. That's right? it. That's it. Like learning about democratization, understanding that your civic duty just doesn't end at voting, right? Bingo. But keeping that pressure on people I mean, are you saying that that is sort of one way? That, well, that is a positive, positive development. Yeah. But also, how do we keep it going? Because yeah. it is that pressure which makes the MPs behave differently, which yeah. makes the president and prime minister behave differently. Mm. I mean, not very differently as we have seen, but you know where I'm getting. Uh, so, but 
that when they get their gas and their electricity and their fuel, are they going, going to, to stop? Are they going to stop? Mm. How do we make them see that they should not stop? And it's yeah. because they did stop that we're here. So it's not, I'm not saying you need to go out and protest every day, but in your, in your own sport, social spaces, in your own workspaces, even if you go to a government department, the kind of questions you ask, the kind of demands you make. Yeah. Uh, when you are stopped by a traffic cop, don't try to bribe your way through it because I keep saying this repeatedly, people don't think twice about giving the traffic cop, you know, 500 or 1000 yeah. rupees to get away. Yeah. But if a minister is engaged in corruption worth hundreds of millions of rupees, my God, he's a crook. So we're complicit in that sense. Exactly. Um, and I guess good citizenship has to start with you, with us, right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It has to start with us, but also it holding the state accountable. So that is positive. Where do we start? I mean, I, I think it's it's not just in one place. It's yeah. about, you know, the next time you cast your vote, find out about the person you're casting your vote for. Yeah. What kind of person do you want to represent you? It is about demanding change in the, well, I think we need a new constitution, not just amendments. I was we going, a, yeah. We need a new mm, constitution. Yeah. Uh, and that was a process that was that the previous government began and yes. there was good progress made in that but due to political reasons that stalled regrettably uh, we need a new constitution and also about laws many of the laws that we have are our legacies from the colonial period yes. they're not fit for purpose you can take you know criminalization of lgbti mm. you know same sex relations yeah, yeah, yeah. the vagrants ordinance the PTA, even yes. our criminal justice system really does need to be rebuilt. I, I don't like the word reform in a sense, I would say rebuild because sometimes it's like you be, do need to go right down to the, the root of it and rebuild it. Yeah. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done and it is going to be a long, hard road because change like this doesn't come overnight and I know from experience even five years you know at the Human Rights Commission was barely enough to make a dent. Yes because there's so much red tape and bureaucracy isn't there's, there? There's red tape, there's bureaucracy so for instance you know the at then because of the 19th amendment to the constitution the Human Rights Commission was uh, legally independent but at the same time in relation to even hiring staff we were not independent because we could not hire the staff we wanted right we need to, to get the approval of the bureaucracy and then that takes time uh, red tape etc uh, they did not understand the kind of people we needed to hire so the qualifications they listed were really not the kind of people we needed to be human rights officers yeah so it is um, and it's also changing attitudes. It's changing attitudes because I think, now let's say, for example, torture. People think that, uh, but once again, I'm positive, I've seen this change over the last couple of years, but people generally think that if you are, let's say, someone um, accused of drug trafficking, then it's okay to, you know, rough you around, to smack you a bit, to torture you. Mm. But if it's a quote unquote good person, then oh my God, they can't be tortured. That in itself a prob is the problem because... Oh, that's a very telling <laughs> distinction you're making, I'm sure. I'm like thinking about it and thinking we all do that, don't we? Absolutely. We, we're all... Because there are people I know, like, oh, if someone stole, uh, they think a person who's helping out in their household has stolen a chain, they will go and report the person to the police. And they're like, oh, quite okay. You can rough them around a bit, you know, smack them around a bit, because if not, how will they tell the truth? And then you'll find out, but there have been many instances where they have assaulted the person and then found out the person had nothing to do with it. Yes. The point is, it's not the police's duty to determine whether a person is innocent or guilty. We have the criminal justice system for that. That is why you file an indictment, you go through a trial process, mm -hmm. and then it is the judge who finds you innocent or guilty. But even then, you cannot be punished in that way. So the police thinking we need to get him to tell the truth and we uh, can use violence for that according to our law. I mean, our constitution says you can't be tortured, Article yeah. 11. We have a law named the Convention Against Torture Act, which criminalizes torture. 
which says that if a, if a, a police or a state officer uh, creates um, uh, engages in violence that causes uh, physical or mental suffering and it is done to extract information or to uh, as a form of discrimination or to intimidate yeah. uh, then it or as a form of punishment it constitutes torture and it says torture is a crime yeah. so although we've had that law on our statute book since uh, uh, 1994 actually yeah it or not, okay uh, we don't know the exact number of people who have been prosecuted under that we still don't know because that information is not public. Right. The Attorney General's Department, the Ministry of Justice have given different figures. I mean, when I was at the Commission, we got different figures. They've given different like numbers to the UN at different times. Right. So we don't actually know the um, exact uh, number as yet. But despite the law being there, you have seen, everyone has seen, particularly in the last few years due to social media, yeah. how common it is for the police to engage in violence. Yes. Violence is uh, the first response la rather than being the last response. Yeah. Uh, therefore, it is also about changing the mindset, you know, about how acceptable, are, how, how do we accept violence? And I think maybe the armed conflict also had um, It's kind of desensitized us, it hasn't it? Definitely desensitized right. us. Um, seeing violence, therefore there is a normalization of violence yeah. and also particularly normalization of the use of violence by the police. To me this is amazing because you know 10 years ago you can't even talk about torture. Even when I was at the Human Rights Commission, yeah. we for the very first time sent to the UN Committee Against Torture a report uh, that detailed um, you know, torture in Sri Lanka yeah. and we called it systemic. And for that, the backlash we received. Uh, we there were single newspapers that um, you know chastised us. We were also uh, the political entity at the time was not very pleased with us. The police were not pleased with us because we called it systemic. Was this earlier this year? No, this is when I was at the commission. Okay, right. This, so this was I think in oh, maybe two thousand. I've forgotten, maybe 2016, I think, late right. 2016, okay. if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but just to say that even in that six years, uh, the, it, I've seen a change in that people, uh, are, there's more conversation about torture. There yeah. is more public acknowledgement about torture. And even the state does not actually deny it now. Because, the, because once again, why? The public are asking questions. The public are outraged. It is in the media. Yeah. And it's because we've shone a light on that, that it has become, and there is more, we're demanding accountability yeah. from the state, which is why I'm saying this to uh, reiterate the point that public awareness, public calls for accountability, mm -hmm. public outrage is extremely important in putting pressure on the government yeah. to behave in a certain way, to adhere to the law, to protect the rights of its citizens. Yes, and it seems to me that finally there is a little bit of this breaking away from um, that I, our, the general public's relationship with authority in a very um, traditional sense, you know. So when you have an MP or a president or whatever, there is a kind of obeisance or you feel like um, I, I have to give this uh, person respect despite what that person is doing. And that person has uh, the potential to harm me or do what they want with the citizenship because that is power. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> you hit the nail on the head. But I also say that we have, you know, Sri Lanka is still, uh, it's a patronage driven society. Yes. We have feudal elements in mm. it. So we did not, the democratic values were not really internalized. As you initially said, yeah. many believe that 
you know, democracy or their role as a citizen was about only casting the vote. Yeah. But actually your role as a citizen, you play in between voting, in holding those people accountable. So I think it is, it's a culture that we patronage driven culture. And I always use this phrase, you know, when you ask people like, why didn't you raise that issue or why didn't you not nice? No. Yes. We really need to get over that. Not nice. No. Um, it drives me mad. But also at the same time, I feel like now that's kind of changing, mm -hmm. you know, with Gota Gogama and uh, Maina Go, Go Maina Gama. Yes. Or oh, is it Maina Gogama? Maina Gogama. It's Maina Gogama, no? Yes. What is your opinion on them playing Pirit non stop, uh, you know, to drown out the protest at Maina Gogama? Yeah. <laughs> well, that is a creative. Uh, and coercive use of uh, <coughs> state power. Yeah. And my thing also points to that how uh, this regime in particular, I mean, historically, the Sri Lankan state has been Sinhala Buddhist nationalist, which is why we've also had the ethnic conflict. Yeah. Uh, but this regime in particular, and I, I said, I've said this before, the president, I think he's a true believer. Previous presidents are, you know, uh, are people who use religion, I mean, or use Buddhism, not religion, pardon me, use mm. Buddhism uh, for political purposes. Yes. Whereas I believe the current president is a true believer and the two pillars of his ideology would be Sinhala Buddhist nationalism and militarization. Yeah. Because whenever there's a problem, he thinks, okay, let, you know, it's like, let's, uh, uh, constitute a task force uh, made up of uh, Buddhist monks yes. or let us bring the military in to do this mm. because those are the two pillars so therefore in a way it is not it's quite uh, it's not surprising and quite uh, poetic and funny that they <laughs> are chanting spirit non-stop to drown out the voices of citizens which the goes, people which goes to show that look Sinhala Buddhist nationalism uh, used against uh, Tamil and Muslim communities in the past and now being used against the Sinhala communities as well. And that is what has given rise to this unprecedented time that we're in. Absolutely. And this is definitely a moment. I, I always said this is a moment, but in Sri Lanka, we've had many moments. Yes, we have. Which we have squandered away. Yeah. <laughs> we must not squander this away because this is an unexpected, amazing moment. Do you think this is the last <laughs> gasp? Do you think this is our last chance? Like if we let this go, um, that that's it. Like we are under sort of a, an authoritarian rule for the foreseeable future. That is what we feared when many of us feared when this government was elected. Yeah. Um, and therefore, this, I won't call it a miracle because I think it's also a confluence of multiple factors, some beyond our control, like yeah. even COVID, yes. that led to this. But I agree, yes, I feel like if we let this moment go, we really can't afford because economically we are at the precipice. Yeah. The uh, economic hardship that people go through is really unimaginable and it's only going to get worse. worse. So we must fix it and fixing it also means electing people who are there not for the power but to do public service. Whereas even now you look at the current political parties, it seems like they're acting still in self-interest, yes. it's about posturing and I think it does have to do and for many will probably uh, strongly disagree with me and I say polite and politely I'm saying strongly disagree with me it has to do also with the brand of politics and toxic masculinity the fact that we have patriarchal sexist misogynist males who crave power who don't take advice who don't listen to others who don't believe that governance is empathy that you need empathy who think that to squash is power and that is a huge problem yeah that is a huge problem uh, we need to change that but uh, that will be challenging because we are a deeply patriarchal society you see that every day even yes. on social media mm -hmm. men who think that they can posture and uh, uh, shut women down yes you don't understand let me tell you how you think <laughs> man's playing <laughs> 
indeed a lot of mansplaining going around. Yeah. But I am glad to see that there are also uh, women, particularly young women, who will really not take any of that yeah. and who push back, which is what we need to be also teaching. But if we want to change the patriarchal nature of our society, it's not just the young women we need to teach it to. That is where we go wrong. Because here we're always telling the young women. Yeah. But you need to teach the, the boys. Boys. Mm -hmm. You need to teach the boys. Yeah. That is where the problem lies. Yeah. And the patriarchal nature, the patriarch patriarchy is uh, perpetuated even within the family. Yeah. Parents do it even unknowingly. Yeah. Yeah. Even today. Mm -hmm. That is very normal. Um, that we must make not so normal. And that also means we need, <coughs> it's not pleasant because people, in any issue, uh, when you are being told that you are doing something wrong, even if it was I, my first yeah. instinct might be defensive, right? Saying, no, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, so we need to get beyond that, I think, and do a little bit of introspection. But this is where the education system comes in. Oh, don't get me started. Don't get me started. It has to be raised to the ground it, entirely. You know, one of the things, especially in recent times that I have started thinking more about is the fact that modern history is not taught. Yeah. We're not taught about 1956. We're not taught about 1983 yeah. or everything else that has come in between the constant in fractions is the word I feel I want to use mm -hmm. against the Tamil community, mm -hmm. against the Muslim community. Um, you know, uh, a few years ago, I was directing a play about 1983 mm -hmm. and the cast had no idea yeah. what 1983 was. And wow. this is also the generation that is yeah. in Gota Gogama and leading that revolution. And, you know, one comment that you made that I found really powerful was um why wasn't the national anthem sung <laughs> in tamil right right because do doesn't it then force you to look even more at the fact of you know here we are we're all united and i'm not i'm not dissing it i'm i'm amazed um i think gota gogama is just incredible it's a Gorgeous. once in a lifetime That's moment um but for all that and all the talk about unity, what you are saying about that thing about thinking, if you want unity, then think, think. Why sing the national anthem only in singular? But then there was a lot of backlash. Mm. I am used to receiving a lot of uh, racist backlash. Yes. Uh, but I must say that uh, the backlash I received for my tweet about the national anthem was quite unlike anything I had experienced Do before. tell. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, people calling me racist, mm. people saying that I am creating an ethnic conflict and uh, it was interesting to see that uh, for instance someone who are, has a who's uh, known to be a liberal had also liked one of those problematic tweets. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there was that, so it was like I I need to um, uh, I need to live the change that I need to go out there and do the work um, things like that. But what was for me positive was that there was uh, this um, you know young woman who uh, sent me a, a DM and uh, said you know I, I feel really bad about it. She didn't have anything to do with that, yeah. but she said I felt really bad about this, and I'm thinking of taking a few of my friends there this evening and going and doing this. What do you think? You think it's a good idea? I said, it's a fantastic idea. Yeah. Go and do it. Mm. And she did do it. Yes. And yeah. it was yeah. on national news. Mm. And what I said when I tweeted is, it's a brilliant uh, thing that you did. But to, in order to ensure that it's not just that moment and it's not performative. Yes. You, every day you need to, in your, in your interactions with other people, what you see in your society you need to raise questions you need to support someone yeah. who you, whose rights you see are being violated yeah that is how we take that moment <clears throat> you know that kind of beautiful moment but can also turn out to be just performative how we make it into long lasting Something. change yeah because if you're talking <laughs> about this country is for all of us then you know the the national anthem the 
Tamil national anthem, it shouldn't be such an issue. But also, it seems like all you have to do, say, say you supported a tweet saying, you know, the Tamil national anthem should be sung. It seems like all you have to do to kind of shut someone up is yeah. say, oh, you're an LTT supporter. <laughs> Right, and you you get it from all sides. I know yes. that I've seen that just you know from pro LTT supporters as well um, saying it. But um, is that what makes us so afraid to confront the question of Tamil nationality? Do they belong here? Do they not? Are their rights being infringed upon every day? You know, people are scared to go there i feel like what's happening is great but also i feel like people are afraid to be openly supportive of injustice towards the tamil community because you're going to be labeled pro ltte tamil but also you know now particularly post 2019 the muslims as well yes uh, yeah yeah the muslims as well I mean, that is one of the reasons is that uh, when you ask for justice, and I've seen this happen repeatedly, particularly if you take the, <clears throat> the families that disappeared yeah. um, and various others who are affected, who have been by now, I think maybe 1,900 days, they would have been protesting yes. in the north and mm -hmm. the east. Um, they are summoned to the terrorism investigation yeah. division or they receive visits from intelligence. They receive phone calls asking them, where are you? What are you doing? I hear, I hear there's a protest day after tomorrow. Are you going for it? Are you organizing it? This has become so common and so normalized that they don't even think that they should complain about it. Yeah. They don't even think that they should tell you. It's only when you talk to them as a kind of by the way remark, they will say, oh, you know, that, you know, he called me that day and he was asking about this protest. Yeah. But if that happened to someone in Colombo, can you imagine the outrage? And it would be like, oh, I received a call from intelligence yes. asking me yeah, yeah. Well, about the event day after tomorrow. And everyone would get mobilized and there would be outrage on social media and all the diplomatic missions would be informed. So it's there is the disparity there, yeah, yeah, right? Absolutely. Uh, and the fact is that even the protests in the north and the east during COVID in particular, after this government came to power, they used COVID as an excuse to obtain court orders right. to prevent these families from demonstrating, yeah. from protesting. All the while, at the same time, they were having large events here in the South. The state was having, the government yeah. was having large events here in the South. So that in itself is discrimination. But this whole labeling, for sure, because there were times, you know, maybe even, let's say, 15 years ago or 20 years ago when uh, there were there was a atmosphere where lawyers would be reluctant to appear for persons yeah. who were arrested under the PTA. Uh, we saw after 2019 Easter attacks when so many Muslims were arrested not on the basis of any evidence, yeah. not even on the basis of reasonable suspicion, yeah. merely because, because I've dealt with many of these cases yeah. uh, when I was at the commission, right. yeah. because they found a Quran in Arabic, they found a magazine in Arabic. There was a case of a father and son being arrested because in their bathroom, they found this small, uh, you know, polythene bag with uh, chlorine, Chlor and a small amount of chlorine. Now, as you may know, you know, outside Colombo, they use chlorine to clean the bathrooms. They don't yeah. necessarily, necessarily go and buy carpet. Right, right? yes. Uh, so they were arrested for that and they were remanded and they were languishing in prison for months before giving, before being given bail. The point to note, even then they were not completely discharged. They were given bail. Why? They should have been discharged yeah. from that case completely. So we saw that and what was disturbing is that initially, particularly for the first few months, people were not raising their voice against this either yeah. because they were afraid because they thought, oh my God, they must all be terrorists. Yes. And if we yeah. raised our voices, then mm. we would be supporting terrorists. Mm. But my point is, even if someone is accused of a terror offense, that person is innocent until proven guilty. Yeah. And that person still has rights. You cannot torture that person. Even yeah. if the person is convicted, you cannot torture that person. Those are basic standards. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think in a society, in Sri Lankan society, we don't believe that. We think, oh, if the person is, you know, a terrorist and arrested on the PTA, must have done something wrong. No, That's so right. we shouldn't speak about it. The people are afraid of being labelled, of being. Now, when you um, uh, raise Tamil-related issues, justice issues, I mean, even for me, it's like even when you try to bring nuance into a conversation, you can't. You can't. Nuance, no one likes. Uh, and so then they would say, oh, but you know, aren't you, uh, why aren't you talking about LTT violations? Excuse me, Google, because then you would see that I have been talking about all violations yes. for a long time yeah. and also been attacked for it yeah. for a long time. Yes. <laughs> so um, the fact is people seem to uh, prefer very simplistic positions, explanations, but the fact is it's not simple. Human yeah. beings are complicated, mm -hmm. they are messy, yeah. they are emotional and even their positions on issues and what they say about something can and does change. Especially if it is a population and I think generally probably our entire population has PTSD, right? Yeah. Because of the war. Yeah. But particularly the people who have been affected in the north and the east, for sure. Yeah. They do. They are severely psychologically impacted and they have not received the support required for it. And when you don't receive that support and they also haven't received adequate socioeconomic support. No. Right? It's no. extremely difficult for them to rebuild their lives. Yes. Um, so once again, we're back to this point of inequality, discrimination. Yeah. Now it's 13 years after the end of the war. Yes. And what state is the population? I mean, the state? North and the East are like military states. Yeah, pretty much. It is very militarized. You see large military camps. camps. And even now, even yesterday, I saw there was an attempt, I think, by the, uh, the Navy to take over some land and the local citizens had protested. Yeah. Uh, the citizens have been protesting, though, and they have managed to stop many of these takeovers due to that. Um, and the question for citizens to ask is, why do you need so many camps in the north and the east? Yeah. Why are you taking over private land? Or why are you even taking over public land? Yeah. Now, for example, the military runs these large farms in the north, right? That's state subsidized. The government, all our taxpayer money, yeah. is what is going to subsidize that. Then from the produce, the agricultural produce that they get from that, they sell at below market rates particularly in a uh, economic environment where people have very little money naturally people will go and buy from them because their rates are so low right but what happens to the local farmer they are undercutting the local farmers the local farmers find it very difficult now this is not something that i that has been happening now yeah this is if you go there to the pinoche something even when i was went there like you know in 2010 people were saying it now it's 2022 people are still saying it. Yeah. Uh, why, why can't you have the agricultural department then running these farms? Then you can actually employ people in it. Why don't you support local farmers, encourage local farming, instead of which you give it to the military yeah. to subsidize that mm -hmm. and then you're undercutting the local population. Which would be affected by this whole fertilizer fiasco Absolutely. anyway. Absolutely. And so, so Gosh, in, in very immediate terms, the, the future for those communities is going to be just awful. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely.